If you have a Bible, take it and turn to Mark 3. During World War II, an Oxford professor named C.S. Lewis was asked to do a series of radio talks about Christianity. These talks were, as you can imagine, a great source of encouragement for a country that was being bombarded. After the war, Lewis took these radio addresses and he compiled them into a book that's called Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity has sold millions of copies. It's been translated into dozens of languages. It's reported that the only book read by more Chinese Christians is the Bible. Lewis was a former atheist, and in his talks and then in his book, he argued that the historical evidence for Christianity is so strong that a person has only three possible responses to Jesus Christ. So here's what Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, a somewhat famous passage. He said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And here was Lewis's conclusion to this part. He said, Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. So according to Lewis, and I think he's right, you have three possible responses to Jesus, that he is a liar, he is a lunatic, or he is Lord. And in Mark 3, we see all three responses. So if you remember, when we started in chapter 1, Mark's focusing on the identity of Jesus. So the Jewish anticipation for the coming Messianic king was very strong. They had formed the picture in their minds of a sort of conquering king, and this picture comes from the Old Testament, but they missed this other part of the picture in the Old Testament, which was that the king would suffer and die in the place of sinners. So, th- so, they, so they had this picture of his identity, which, which was mistaken. It was, it was sort of deformed. And so Mark in chapter 1 starts to correct that picture of the Messiah's identity. And then last week we saw in chapter 2 how... They expected the Messiah to come bearing great authority, that he would have authority, particularly they thought, to crush Rome, who had occupied and conquered Israel, and to affirm them, to say to the religious leaders, like, you guys are doing a great job. But instead, Jesus comes, and with his authority, he doesn't crush Rome, he doesn't affirm them, instead he reaches out to sinners. He forgives sin. He he meets and he eats with with those who are tax collectors and sinners, sort of the lowest of the low, the outcasts. Because Jesus has been busy doing miracles and healing people, by the time chapter 3 opens up, there are these large crowds of people that are following him. And and this is the focus of Mark's account as he begins chapter 3, are the crowds that follow him. He mentions the crowd six different times here in chapter 3. Look again at verse 7. Jesus departed with his disciples to see, notice this, and a large crowd followed him from Galilee. And a large crowd followed from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, Tyre and Sidon. Here it is again. The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. Four times in those three verses he mentions the crowd. People are coming from all over to see Jesus. So the geographical regions that he mentions, they're, they're to the north, south, east, and west of where Jesus is. And so Mark's saying people are coming from everywhere. These regions aren't just Jewish regions. Many of them are Gentile regions. So not just coming from everywhere, but all kinds of people are coming to Jesus because they've heard there's this man who heals sick people. In fact, there are so many of them that there's danger that Jesus may be trampled. And so he tells his disciples to prepare a a floating pulpit for him in case the crowds get too large. So why does Mark emphasize the crowds? Four times here, again in chapter, er, verse 20, again in verse 32. Because he wants us to consider how people will respond to Jesus. 
I mean, these people, they've journeyed from long distances to find Jesus. Many of them either sick themselves or bringing someone who's sick, possibly lame, possibly blind. It's a difficult journey, but they've heard that there's this one who might be able to heal them. So they, they take this trip of many miles. Maybe even this is all of the resources they've had. It's like we have just enough to get there, and hopefully he can do something. So so they've all gathered there. They've all come to see him. Large crowds of different types of people flock to him. Now what will they do? And this is the question I'm going to ask. What will these crowds make of Jesus? How will they respond to him? And then he gives us three different examples in the rest of chapter 3. So you have his disciples who respond to him by calling him Lord, following him. You have his family who calls him a lunatic. And then ultimately you have these religious leaders who call him a liar. Before the, we see these three responses, notice what Jesus continues to do. He continues to heal the sick and cast out demons. So look at verse 10. It says, since he has healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him just to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. So here Jesus is, he is displaying his power over both the spiritual and physical world. That he heals people's bodies, but he also heals their souls. So we live in a culture that is focused almost exclusively on physical health. For example, the average salary for a physician is four to five times the salary of a pastor or priest. That's because that's what we value. We value physical health. We've, we've seen this a lot in the last couple of years with the pandemic. The effect of isolation on the soul has rarely been mentioned as most people focus on physical health. How can I stay safe and not get sick? Even Christians in the name of physical safety have, have missed church for months without thinking like, what might this do to my soul? Well, Jesus enters a very similar climate. A, 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 a people that are focused on physical issues. They're focused primarily on the fact that we're occupied by Rome, but even their religious service has become very physical. We, we go here and we do this and we make sure not to do this. And, do, and everything's very physical. And Jesus, as he heals the sick but also casts out demons, he's sort of opening everyone's eyes to the fact that there's something bigger going on. That there's something beyond what they can see. That around them, that's invisible to them is this grave spiritual battle. And he came not simply to fix the problems we think we have, the things we can touch around us. He, he came to deliver us from something that is far bigger than, than we even realize. Now, beginning in verse 13, we start to see these responses to Jesus. Here's the first one. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. So look at verse 13. Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles to be with him to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So Jesus selects twelve men as his unique representatives to the world. He will prepare them and then send them out sort of as ambassadors, as emissaries to carry on his ministry. Now, no Jewish person would have missed the significance of Jesus going up on a mountain and selecting 12 men. This, this mirrors Israel's history, right? Where, where you have these 12 apostles are paralleling the 12 tribes of Israel while, while Jesus, like a new Moses, ascends on a mountain to give them God's will. Here, here's what Jesus is saying and doing. that He's showing that he is starting a brand new humanity that's made up of Jew and Gentile alike. Jesus takes all of the promises in the Old Testament and he fulfills them in ways that far exceed what anyone would have imagined. The 12 apostles, they they won't simply go like the 12 tribes to the small land. They'll instead go to the very corners of the globe and there they will call people of all tribes and tongues and nations to come back to a, a brand new Jerusalem that unites heaven and earth and covers all of God's restored creation. These 12 apostles are the new wine that we looked at last week from chapter 2. Jesus is doing a, a brand new thing far exceeding and surpassing what anyone envisioned. So how does Jesus prepare these men to, to preach and minister? What's the curriculum? Here it is. He spends time with them. 
Like, that's it. Like, he becomes the object of their study. They, they observe how he walks and talks, how he listens and he loves. They learn his will and his ways. And brothers and sisters, this is why we focus our sermons and our studies and our lives on Jesus. Like he alone is the great object of our study. Here's our goal. We just need to see and understand and love him more. And when we do that, that's when we start to impact people. Though the 12 have a unique role as the apostles, they are a model for all disciples of Jesus. And this is important. We've been talking about this the last two weeks, right? Is that Mark has written his gospel 30 years or so, 25, 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so there are churches that have gathered, these groups of disciples that are being established and they're spreading around the world. And they're following Jesus, but in some ways, some of them are going like, I'm following Jesus. What does that mean? And so they get Mark's gospel and it starts to show them, here's what it means. When you say you're a follower of Jesus, this is what it looks like. And so he's helping us understand, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? (coughs) Excuse me. Well, we see one thing is that becoming a follower of Jesus starts to transform a, a person's identity. So he says in verse 16 that he renames Simon. Not because Jesus likes nicknames, but because he's, he's making us point that I'm changing this man. And he does the same thing in verse 17 with James and John. But then in verse 18, we find all of the list of, of the dis- other disciples of Jesus. And the final one on the list is a man named Simon the Zealot. Now, zealots were, an, were a very militant, pro-Israel, anti-Rome group. At times, they incited violence against the Roman oppression. Rome would have considered them domestic terrorists. Some Jewish people would have said, oh, they're freedom fighters. Other Jewish people, maybe the majority, would have have been somewhat annoyed with them because their, their attacks against Rome, their insurrection, often made Rome crack down on all Jewish people. So one of the 12, Simon, is violently anti rome Another one of the 12, Levi, we looked at this last week, named Matthew. He's a tax collector, which means he works for Rome. So in first century Jewish politics, this is far right and far left. As far right and far left as you can possibly get. And Jesus chooses both of them. Why? Could it be to show us that political differences are meaningless compared to following Jesus? Like, we have no recorded incident of conflict between Simon and Levi. It could have happened, maybe, and not been recorded in Scripture, but it doesn't tell us. Here's what it tells us about Simon and Levi. They came from these two drastically different ideological positions, and they both followed Jesus until they died. That's what we know. Like, they leave their allegiance to the kingdoms of this world in order to pledge allegiance to a new kingdom which surpasses all earthly kingdoms. So brothers and sisters, is there a political issue that would divide you from other Christians? Do you prioritize your ideology over following Christ? Or over someone else who does? So in the past few years, differences of opinions on politics and pandemics have split a lot of churches wide open. And what a shame. Is Jesus really not bigger than our differences? And don't think this is what we might do. We might say, well, we, I mean, it's just way worse now. They didn't have CNN and Fox News back then. Imagine living in a country that's been conquered by another country. We can't. We're we're Americans. We can't imagine that. But let's try. Like, we've been conquered. So when we walk down the street, we see on every street corner, not, not a policeman, but someone wearing the military uniform of the country which conquered us. Not only that, all of our leaders, including our religious leaders, have to go to that occupying country to get permission. I mean, separation of church and state? No, the state was everything. In fact, that becomes one of the severe conflicts between Christianity and Rome because Christians wouldn't say that Caesar is Lord. 
So was it, is it worse now? No. And yet, somehow they said following Jesus is far more important than, than how I view these things, my perspective on these things. So they said, I, I, there's nothing I won't willingly set aside in order to follow Jesus. The twelfth and final apostle is mentioned in verse 19. Look at it. It says, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Mark adds this comment about Judas's betrayal for a couple reasons. One is that he's making us look ahead to the cross. Remember, this view of the Messiah does not, the popular view of the Messiah does not include a cross. It includes a throne, but not a cross. And so Mark, every chance he gets, is sort of saying, hey, this is where Jesus is headed. We're following him, so that, that maybe tells us something about where we may experience. So this is always do this. But here's the other reason he tells us this. Because here's a man who professes Jesus as Lord, but doesn't actually follow him. That it's possible, Mark is telling us, we are followers of Jesus. Maybe we say with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, but our hearts don't bow to him. Like that is possible. It is possible to be included amongst those who confess Jesus as Lord without actually doing it ourselves. And so there's a warning for us here. Now normally a detail like this, told at the beginning of a story, spells doom. Right? So if you say at the beginning of a story, uh, there's a new king, he's coming to power, but one of his closest advisors is a traitor. Well, here's what we're expecting. Bad things are coming. Like this king's not going to last. His kingdom is built upon a shaky foundation and it's, it's, it's going to crash at some point. But because Jesus conquers death by dying, Judas' betrayal doesn't stop his plan. In fact, he does not die because Judas betrays him. He'll make this point clear very much later. He'll say, I lay down my life. I mean, this king his desire and his plan to go to the cross in the place of sinners, it is not because Judas betrayed him. He willingly chose to die for those who call him Lord. Here's the second response to Jesus. Jesus is a lunatic. Jesus is a lunatic. We meet Jesus' family twice in this chapter. So drop to the end of the chapter. Look at verse 31. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. Him, a crowd was sitting around him and told him, Look, your mother, your brothers, your sisters are outside asking for you. Now go up a few verses to verse 20. Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. Jesus has an earthly family. So it's made up of a mother. It's made up of multiple step or half brothers and half sisters. And so what we see here is that the Roman Catholic teaching that Mary was a perpetual virgin, it contradicts Scripture. That after God gave Mary Jesus through the, through the virgin birth, that she married Joseph and they, they lived as husband and wife and produced other offspring. Now we know this from other passages of Scripture, that Jesus' brothers, particularly, and possibly his brothers and sisters, they did not believe he was the Messiah until after his death and resurrection. And so here his whole family is, they're trying to force him away from the crowds and they call him crazy. Why do they say this? I mean, that's a pretty strong statement, right? That they're publicly saying Jesus is crazy, he's lost his mind, he's a lunatic. Well, here's one reason, because miracles are crazy. Right? Miracles are crazy, because for something to be miraculous... It must defy conventional explanations. If you can explain it sort of conventionally, it's not a miracle, right? It's got to defy those type of things. And so here you are. Just try to, try to imagine we're Jesus' half-brothers. You grew up in a home with him. You probably heard stories of angelic visits. You notice, I'm sure of this, you notice Jesus is in trouble a lot. But you don't think it's probably because he's so great. You think it's because he's unfairly treated and you're persecuted by your parents. Because every child thinks that. So, so Jesus doesn't do miracles while you're growing up. We, we know Jesus' first miracle, the first time he does this is, is at, at a wedding in Cana. Long after he's, he's grown up and out of the house. So Jesus doesn't do miracles like, Jesus does regular stuff. 
I mean, he goes to bed at night, he wakes up, and his hair sticks up in different directions. He, he was taught by Joseph before Joseph died how to build furniture and how to carve things out of stone. And for the last 15 years, this is what he's done. Like he, he worked in the shop and he created things. He, just, he did, I mean, he was really good at things, but he, he didn't do anything miraculous. And so no wonder that when you hear that people are flocking from all over a nation to go visit your brother because he's healing them, here's your thought. He's gone crazy. I've never seen him heal anyone. So I was thinking about what I would say if, if you came to me and told me that you witnessed a miracle performed by someone I knew. So you came to me and you said, Josh, I went out to eat with Adam earlier this week. And they didn't bring me my hush puppies. So Adam reached into the basket and he took out his hush puppies and he prayed and he just started pulling them to pieces and he, he ended up feeding hush puppies to the entire restaurant. Here's an extra basket. Well, he said, Josh, I invited Uncle Don out on the boat. We were going, we were just going down the water and my hat flew off. And Don jumped out of the boat, landed on the water and just sort of walked over, picked up my hat, walked back, jumped in the boat, which Don jumping, that might be the miraculous part, but he jumped in the boat he wasn't even wet. I mean, if, if anyone comes to me this week and tells me one of those two things happens, here's what I would say. You've lost your mind. You're crazy. Because miracles are crazy unless, unless there's a reason to believe them. I know this. I know Adam and I know Don are not God. So Jesus' family, they don't yet believe he's God. And so therefore, the only explanation right now that makes sense to them is that he's gone crazy. Now, there could be another reason that influences them to make this claim. So we see in the next verse that religious leaders had come down from Jerusalem to basically tell everyone that Jesus is under Satan's control. He's a satanic teacher. So these men who've come down from Jerusalem, you've got to understand, these are, these are the men who run the country at least from sort of a Jewish perspective. Rome has controlled Israel, but they're the ones who run it. So they're the ones, listen, who have the power and authority to excommunicate a family from the temple and from the synagogue. So if you do something that violates what they think you should do, they have the ability to remove you from the temple, from the synagogue, to in essence make you non-Jewish, which means that you're no longer invited to anything. Right? You're, you're a social outcast. Because no, no upstanding Jewish person would invite you who's been excommunicated, you're a heretic, into their home. Be beyond that, right, you, your business is it's about to crater. You're about to go bankrupt because no one's going to come use your services as well. No one who's Jewish because like, you've been cast out. And so it seems to you your fate hangs in the balance. It's in these men's hands. And so calling Jesus crazy is a way to, to save face. It's a way to distance yourself from him. Maybe you even think it's a way to protect him. Because a worse charge is what the charge they're making. That he's in league with Satan. So, so no, no, he's not. He's just crazy. So have you ever been tempted to downplay something in the Bible because you don't want people to look down on you? Maybe you're in a situation where like there's a, just a fear of what somebody will think about you. And so you say, you know, this, you make this offensive thing that God says or feels offensive a little less offensive. You reinterpret certain parts to sort of make it more acceptable to the culture. Right? Fearing someone's opinion over what God says, we should be able to understand where this comes from. So if Jesus is not Lord, then maybe he's a lunatic. Maybe he's deranged. Maybe we would, they would even say, like, I think he believes it. And he clearly has convinced these guys around him. But it's just insane. It's crazy. It's really not believable. This leads to the third choice. Jesus is a liar. Jesus is a liar. So the, the religious leaders, they've journeyed down from Jerusalem, which is the center of all Jewish worship. 
And they have not come down on a mission, on a journey to discover the truth. They've come down because they're making a statement, sort of an official proclamation about Jesus. Verse 22. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, or Satan, the name for Satan, and he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. So their claim is this, Jesus is a liar, he's a fraud, he's a deceiver. He is actually operating under the leadership of Satan himself. And they don't just say this once. It should really be translated, they kept saying this. So they kept telling people, like, this is who Jesus is. He's operating under Satan's authority. Now, now think about what this does. This is pretty crafty. By claiming Jesus is operating under Satan's authority, that he's a deceiver, it gives them an, a reason to discount everything he says and does. So if you just say Jesus is evil or Jesus is a bad guy, then the person who just got healed, like, he just healed me. Like, how can he be a bad guy? I, I've been lame for 30 years, now I can walk. So that's not the charge they make. They say he's deceptive. Because then, no matter what he does, you can, you can dismiss it. So if Jesus does something that you don't like, you can say, see, he follows Satan. Now, if he does something that everyone would say is good, you say, yeah, he's doing that to deceive you. They've just laid a groundwork now to dismiss everything because even all the great things Jesus does, that no one can argue against, they say, but he's got an ulterior motive. He's doing it to deceive you, to reel you in. He's really in league with the devil. Jesus answers this sort of ridiculous charge in two ways. So he, the first way he does is he says, if, if, if I am really working for Satan to cast out demons who also work for Satan, that signals a civil war in Satan's kingdom. So, so if I work for Satan to bring about Satan's downfall, then I'd really be working against Satan. So, so in other words, it's completely illogical that Satan has sent me to help destroy his own kingdom. Look at verse 23. He says, he asks this question, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is finished. It makes no sense. But what makes more sense, Jesus says, is that I've defeated Satan. And every time I cast out a demon, I am further, further dismantling Satan's work. Verse 27. He says, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. And you understand the point he's making here, right? Then, once you tie up the strong man, once you beat him, once he's subservient to you, then you plunder his house. When does Satan first appear in the Bible? In the Garden of Eden, right? So Genesis 1 and 2, God creates all of mankind. Adam and Eve placed them in a garden. One command. All of a sudden, chapter 3, it says a serpent enters and the serpent speaks. This is serpent. Is, is Satan has taken on the form of the serpent and he speaks to Eve and he tempts her and... She gives in the temptation, Adam along with her, they eat, and humanity is cast into sort of oppression and subservience to sin. Everything good that God had made starts to be broken. Would the Jewish religious leaders have been familiar with this story? Yes. In fact, they, they likely would have had it memorized. I mean, this is foundational. And then in the midst of this this account of Satan's temptation and Adam and Eve giving into it. God comes in judgment and he judges Adam and then he judges Eve and then he judges the serpent. And in the middle of this judgment on the serpent, he makes a promise, which is, is sort of the, the key promise to sort of interpret all of the Bible. And it was certainly a promise that would have, would have been well known and well understood and, and, and much, much anticipated by all Jewish people. So it says this, Genesis 3.15, Jesus, or God says to the serpent, I will put hostility between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between, notice this, your offspring and her offspring. What, what might the offspring of Satan be? It, these are the demonic forces. These are not physical offspring, but just those who 
follow, follow him, who he is the quote-unquote father of. So there will be enmity between these demonic forces and between the offspring of the woman or the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman, he will strike your head. He will crush your head, and in doing so, you will strike or bite his heel. Right? This is a key promise, talking about the defeat of Satan and his demonic forces by the Messiah. And so God has promised, and the Jewish people have, have listened to the promise, and they're awaiting the coming of the Messianic king, because he will bring in the defeat of Satan, and he'll start to fix everything that's been broken by sin. And so all of a sudden, Jesus appears, and he's casting out demons, There's clearly enmity between him and these demonic forces, the offspring of Satan. He heals people, so what sin is broken, he starts to repair. And he's he's plundering in all of these acts the kingdom of Satan. So what deduction should the religious leaders have made? He's here. (laughs) He exists. Exactly what we've been waiting for for centuries. He is here. He's doing exactly what what God said he would do. He is taking it to Satan. He has conquered him. And he's starting one by one to, to make all things new. This is what we've been anticipating. Yet God is restoring all things through his Messiah. And clearly this is what Jesus is doing. I mean, that's the logical deduction from the actions and the success of Jesus, that Jesus is dismantling the kingdom of Satan one person at a time. I mean, this is wonderful news, that the reign of sin is coming to an end. This is what we celebrate in the fall as we studied Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Right? We, we are not obligated to live according to the flesh. We can put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit of God who lives in us all because the Messiah came and crushed the serpent's head. In Romans 8, we pictured our sin. You remember this? Our sinful flesh like a rhino in a restaurant. Lots of power but no authority. We don't have to listen. We don't have to give in. We can starve by God's grace the rhino and so that we can live free from sin. We can see victory that our Sin's dominion, its power, its its mastery over us was broken because of what Jesus did. This is just wonderful news. This is the news the world had been waiting for. And yet, the religious leaders refuse to see it. They refuse. They willfully reject Jesus. They shake their fist in the face of God's Messiah ignoring the evidence of his identity and his authority, and they place themselves in determined opposition to him. And here's what Jesus warns them, that that kind of deliberate, direct rejection of God's work through the Spirit brings eternal condemnation. Look at verse 28. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this passage. I think some Christians walk around concerned that they may commit or have committed the unforgivable sin, and there's just no hope. I remember when I was, I think in high school, a couple of my brothers were playing basketball, and it ended in a fight. That happened every time we played basketball. Basketball turned into football, Somebody finally got angry, and at some point, a ball was chucked at one, at one brother, at the other, and the, one of the brothers yelled at the other, you're a fool, and sort of stormed out of the gym. And I just remember thinking in this verse, whoever calls his brother a fool is liable to judgment in hell. Okay. And I, like, went after my brother. I'm like, you need to, like, you need to confess that. I, like, otherwise, you're going to go into hell. Right? There's, Jesus is not warning about some specific sin that if we, oh, if you do that, that's it. That's like, oh, if you call your brother a fool, that's it. You're, nope, just no hope. This is a warning about rejecting the Spirit's testimony of Jesus. 
that if you understand who Jesus is and you still reject him, you will never experience his forgiveness. One author wrote, it isn't that God gets especially angry with one sin in particular. It's rather that if you decide firmly that the doctor who is offering to perform a life-saving operation on you is in fact a sadistic murderer, you will never give your consent to the operation. If you're convinced that Jesus is a servant of Satan and not the Son of God, then you will never come to him and ask him to forgive your sin and save you. So Jesus isn't, he doesn't issue this warning. So if you're a Christian and you, this is always, you've always been a little scared of committing a certain sin that is unforgivable, that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's just warning you that if you reject Jesus as Lord, there are eternal devastating consequences. That you can choose to call him a liar. You can choose to call him a lunatic. You can choose to say none of this happened. But if you do so, you will not escape the consequences that come from that. After showing us these three possible responses to Jesus, Mark ends this chapter with a beautiful invitation from Jesus to join his family. It says in verse 33 that after they mentioned his mothers and brothers and sisters, Jesus replied to them, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those in a sitting in a circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sister. Now, I think because of our modern view of family, these words sound less radical to our ears. But 2,000 years ago in Middle Eastern sort of culture, the family is everything. Families are multi-generational. Grandparents help raise the children alongside parents. You all live in the same place. You all do the same job. You don't, you don't get a job or choose a career by putting your resume online. Right? You, you, what does your dad do? What does your grandpa do? You're going to do it too. And so you are born, you live, you work, you marry, you raise a family, and then you die all on the same piece of land with your family. Sometimes we joke with my wife's parents that they must have been really bad parents because they live in Wisconsin and their three children live in North Carolina, Texas, and Wyoming. It was like everyone ran as far as possible away. They're not bad parents. That's just what we do, right? You know, I, you, know you marry a woman from Wyoming, so you live there. You, you know, you've always wanted to avoid winter, and so you go to Texas. Like, this is just what we do. It's not strange to us. But what Jesus says to the crowd this day would have been shocking because he is extending that to them an invitation to join his family. What he's not doing, and what it maybe appears at first is that he's sort of casting aside his earthly family. He's not. But what he is saying is saying, my true family shares something deeper than blood. We all share grace. We all follow God's will, which means to follow me, to be united with me, to bow before me as Lord. You know, the privilege of having God as your father and Jesus as your brother, here's what Jesus says, it's in no way dependent upon who you were born to or where you were born or how successful you are or what you've achieved, your social status. It's not even dependent upon how moral you are. It's only dependent upon whether you turn to Jesus. Like, that's it. If Jesus is your Lord, then you are part of God's family, and if you reject him as Lord, then you're on your own. Have you ever considered that most of our relationships are out of our control? Like, you didn't choose your parents. And even if your parents ask you for your opinion, like, you didn't choose your brothers and sisters. They didn't really care. They were going to have those kids anyway, you know. You can choose your house, but not your neighbors. You can choose your college, but not your classmates. You can choose your job, but right, you can't choose your coworkers. There is one relationship that's your choice, and that's who you marry, right? And that's, that's the one where you get to choose. Oh, so many of you couples just like leaned and nudged. That's so sweet. But you choose that. You choose it. You say like, I, I want to be part of this family. I want to take this name. Like, I choose this. So, so consider this. That the God who made everything and who rules over all the universe is so kind and gracious 
that he says to you, I'm giving you the choice to join my family. It's your choice. That Jesus, his son, spreads our, open his arms wide and he says to all these people around him, he says, you can come and be my brothers and sisters. Then he leaves his arms wide open and he dies in the place of sinners so that we can come to God without stain that we can gather around God's table. That you become a child of God, not because of the blood that runs through your veins, but because of the blood that dripped from his hands and feet. So what is your response to Jesus? Are you a part of his family? The earthly brothers of Jesus who rejected him, who called him a lunatic, they eventually bowed their knee to him as Lord. In fact, one of those brothers named James became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem and he wrote one of the books, the Bible. It's never too late to turn to Jesus and become part of his family. Will you pray with me?